Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome back to class on Christology. Uh, how are all of you doing? How are our in-person students uh, and the online students doing? How's Anthony, Nina, Jackin? Thank you for joining class this morning. And also uh, Sri Radha. How are all of you doing? Good. Anyone sleepy this morning? <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. Um, so can I ask, Sri Radha, can you lead us in prayer, please? Yes, Pastor. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Okay. okay. Father God, we thank you for this time. Thank you for these uh, classes. And uh, uh, we thank you for you have given us a new day, you, a new morning. And we submit this day in your hand, God. You guide us, you lead us, you give us wisdom and knowledge that we can understand your word. Uh, we can understand your teaching, God. And uh, by Holy Spirit, you guide us. Um, in ev uh, everything we surrender in your hand, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you, uh, Sri Radha. Last week, we um, uh, since we lost connection in a, when I was talking about. Um, just give me a second, please. Yeah. Last week, when we were talking about. Um, You know, what, what does it mean when we say that Jesus sat on the right hand of the Father? And we were looking at it uh, in, in the notes, so I explained that. And at that time, I uh, realized that we I got disconnected. And so um, I have posted uh, the content um, uh, on the stream page for you all to read, so you all can um, read and uh, since it's so important, and even we had one question from Rin who asked us, what does it mean when Jesus sat at the right hand of Father? Sorry? Yes. When Jesus sat at the right hand of the Father, uh, what does it mean? And also we were looking at uh, our notes uh, towards the end of um, uh, chapter 7 when we were looking at... Um, you know uh, the point where we were look uh, we were talking about the divine exchange and we, uh, we looked at second corinthians chapter 8 uh, verse 9 and the first point said that you know uh, christ came to our level to lift us up to his level at the right hand of god so what does it mean uh, and at that time we got disconnected got disconnected and so you all um, uh, online students missed out on what I had said, so have posted that uh, uh, th that contents in the stream page. You can read it um, after class. Okay. Any questions uh, on chapter seven and chapter eight? What we studied last week, we we began looking at chapter eight as well. The virginal conception. Anyone has any questions? No, anyone from our in-person students have any questions or the online students? Okay, if there are no questions, um, we'll move on to chapter 9, uh, where we'll be talking about uh, Jesus, uh, who is the sinless lamb, who became the sinless uh, lamb. Okay, so we're going to basically consider this title or role of Jesus Christ, uh, which we see both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So Jesus is given this title as the Lamb of God, the sinless Lamb, um, and what was his role as that sinless Lamb, as the Lamb of God. Now, the word Lamb is presented over 30 times in the New Testament, Okay, and uh, if you look at John chapter 1, verse 29, can one of you please read that? John chapter 1, verse 29. John verse 129. 
The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay. So uh, we've already studied this verse before. Uh, we looked at it before. Uh, we know that Jesus came as a Lamb of God. Uh, and why does uh, the Apostle John use the word Lamb there? Why didn't he just say that, you know, Jesus, the Son of God, or the Word that became flesh, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth, he took the sins of the world. Okay, why didn't he... Why didn't he not phrase it that way? But why does he say Jesus came as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world? To? To let the people of Israel know that... Okay. Okay. Actually, basically, yes, that this is Jesus who is going to make the sacrifice because lamb was a very uh, you know uh, so much part of the, the israelite community because of the rituals they used to uh, uh, you know have which is su such a centerpiece of their life uh, a part of their life part of their whole uh, uh, you know spiritual journey with god or the rituals or what they did on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis okay so every day there was a lamb that was sacrificed we'll study about it, a lamb that was sacrificed in the morning and in the evening. It was not just the lamb that was sacrificed one day in the year on the day of atonement, but it was the lamb that was sacrificed every day in the morning, a morning sacrifice, evening sacrifice, and even if when people um, committed any sins, they, you know, there were sins that uh, need to be atoned for or covered for, which they made uh, the sacrifice using a uh, lamb. So, uh, you know, lamb was so much part of their whole understanding, their thinking, um, their whole concept of what, uh, you know, their relationship with God, everything also, you know, uh, 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 was kind of centered around the rituals, but the lamb had so much of a significance in the lives of the uh, Israelite. So there was only one way that, you know, sin could be atoned for, and that was by making the sacrifice, by cutting the uh, lamb and shedding the blood, and the blood that was shed of this lamb, which had to be spotless, which had to be without any blemish, which had to be healthy and... Uh, you know, a, a male lamb, one one year or less than a year old, uh, which had to be um, sacrificed. And so we see that Jesus was referred to as the Lamb of God. Why? Because he was the he was the one who perfectly suited the whole concept of the Lamb that was sacrificed. Because he was sinless, he was without any blame, he was spotless, without any blemish. And he was righteous and um, holy. Okay, so we also see that Jesus came to die not only for the sins of the Israelite race, but he came to die for the sins of the whole world. He paid for the sins of the whole world by making the full, sufficient, and perfect sacrifice. Okay, Jesus Christ is also, uh, uh, you know, um, is mentioned as the Passover Lamb or the Paschal Lamb. Okay, why is he mentioned as the Passover lamb? We look at that. Okay, so can one of you please clearly uh, read for us Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 14? Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. Is there in your notes? Uh, can one of you please read? So this 12, 1 to 14. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself if himself a lamb, according to those house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons according to each man's need you shall make you count make your count for the lamb your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year 
you may take it from the sheep of or from the goats now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two drops drop posts and on the lintel of the house where they ate it then they shall eat the flesh then they shall eat the flesh legs and its eternals do not eat raw nor boiled at all with water but roasted in fire its head with its legs and its entrails you shall let none of it remain until morning and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire and thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand so you shall eat it in haste in the it is the lord's passover for i will pass through the land of egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of egypt both men and beast and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as feast by an everlasting ordinance. ordinance. Amen. Thank you. So here we see that God is preparing the people of Israel um, to move out of Egypt, okay, from slavery out of Egypt into the promised land, into freedom. Uh, he's leading them to the land of promise that is Canaan, okay, and uh, this time he is... Uh, it's the tenth plague that he's going to bring about on the land of Egypt, and uh, that will, you know, kind of seal their going out of uh, uh, Egypt. That will give them um, uh, an, a, a way where they can exit out of uh, Egypt. And here we see that, you know, God's telling them that uh, whatever I have asked you to do on this day, you need to do it throughout your generations okay should keep this feast as a lasting or an everlasting ordinance everlasting means what it lasts for ever and ever for eternity okay everlasting um, ordinance but why don't we celebrate the feast of the passover why don't we celebrate the feast of the passover even though it says here that it should be an everlasting ordinance huh we are celebrating Jesus, yes, because, uh, you know, he has become the Passover lamb. He has made the full sufficient perfect sacrifice and we don't have to offer any more uh, sacrifice. But we just celebrate by remembering what he has done. And one of them is, you know, when we partake in the Lord's uh, uh, table. Okay. So here we see that, you know, this Passover festival was supposed to be, uh, uh, God tells them it's the first month of the Jewish calendar, which is um, the month of March and um, April, okay? So we see that the Passover actually spoke or it pointed out to the redemptive work of Jesus. What is the meaning of redemptive work? Redemption means what? When you redeem something, means what? When you buy back, yes. You know, when uh, when people don't have money, you know, they go and pledge their uh, their home or their house or their car or, you know, their gold or ornaments or gold or whatever they have, uh, whatever bonds they have, they pledge it so that they can get cash. But if they want to get back what they have pledged, they have to repay the, the debt. They have to repay the money that they have. Um, taken it and of course you have to repay it with uh, interest so when we see that when we say that Jesus you know um, became the Passover lamb which and he by you know uh, he it pointed out to his redemptive works so the Passover the whole ritual of Passover why God wanted them to do it is not because God was interested in rituals 
right? Like other religions are so ritualistic minded. A God is not a God who is, you know, focused on keeping rituals, but he is asking them to do these rituals because all of these rituals, all of these sacrifices, all of what they celebrated actually was a type and shadow, which means it was pointing out to the Messiah. It was pointing out to Jesus Christ. So every ritual they had to do, every sacrifice, everything that they had to celebrate, everything they had to follow during the Passover was not something that was just do it as a ritual, uh, you know, just as, you know, just to please God, but it was all pointing to the coming of the Messiah. It was pointing out to the work and the role of the Messiah. It was pointing out to Jesus, who was the Lamb of God. So in Jesus, we see all of these rituals, all of these sacrifices, everything having its meaning in the person and the work of Jesus. Isn't that so beautiful? So actually the, the Israelites, you know, the, the rituals became such a burden for them. You know, they were not enjoying what they were doing. It was becoming very uh, burdensome. And that's why they were, even when they were offering it, they were not offering it in the way that God wanted them to do. And they felt so burdened by it. But actually God did not give them those rituals to burden them, right? The rituals that God give, gives us is not to burden us, but actually it is something that we can enjoy in the person, the work of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. But for the for us now, it is to enjoy the finished work of Jesus on the cross. But for the Old Testament people, it was actually a type and shadow, which means it was something pointing up, pointing further or pointing to um, uh, the Son of God who would come and who would fulfill all of these, you know, rituals, these sacrifices would be fulfilled in his work in what he did on the um, cross, okay? So redemptive work means, you know, Jesus on the cross, He, when he died, he paid the redemption price to redeem us from sin, death, and Satan, okay? So there was, there is a price, right, for our sin. What is the price for our sin? What's the price for our sin? Death, yes. Death, not just, uh, you know, uh, physical death, but also eternal death. But when Jesus came, what did he do? You know, he redeemed us from sin, death, and slavery to Satan by paying the price. Who did he pay the price to? Satan? No, he had to pay the price to God, not to Satan, because Satan was not somebody who we went against. It was We went against God. We broke his... Uh, laws. We broke his commandments. We went against his uh, standards. We fell short of the glory of God. Okay. Romans chapter 3. So here, in, in, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, can one of you please read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, please? Give it to him. He's ready. We have One Corinthians uh, chapter five verse seven. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. Unleavened, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Thank you. So here, Amen. It says, you know, therefore purge out the old leaven. Okay. What is the meaning of the word purge? It means purify, cleanse, remove. Okay, so here this Paul is telling the church at Corinth, therefore purge means therefore purify, cleanse, clean, remove. So what is he saying to purify, cleanse, clean and remove? The old leaven. Okay, so that you may be a new lump since you are truly are unleavened for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Now what is the meaning of this? Why does Paul use leaven, old, uh, new lump, you're truly unleavened? It's because he's talking to uh, Jewish uh, believers, okay? Judaizers, you know, Jewish Christians, and they know what is the meaning of leaven, even though we don't understand in our context, 
they knew what is the meaning of leaving, old leaving, new lump, unleaving. They knew everything about it because it, this leaving was connected to the uh, Passover. So what is leaving? It's, uh, you know, the leaving mentioned isn't merely east. You know what is east, right? You know, people put east uh, to make the bun and bread fluffy and nice and puffed up and you know, biscuits and all that. They put little east. Okay, even when you make dosa and idli, people put little yeast uh, so that the dough rises up and it's really nice and fluffy and um, soft. Okay, so here it's the leaven is not actually um, uh, yeast, it's actually the dough that is, you know, they, they, the, the Israelites used to make, like, like we make chapati, but they used to make bread and, you know. Uh, so the dal they use, what they used to do, the Israelites, is they used to keep a little of the old dal and they would put that old dal in the new dal. So the old dal was actually uh, fermented. Because it is fermented, it will ferment the new dal. So it acts like an um, yeast, okay? So it is this this uh, old dal, which is uh, old leaven, which is, you know, it's a sour, sour dal, which kind of, uh, you know, leavens up the... Um, the new dough. So this is, you know, how bread was commonly made in the uh, in the, in the ancient world, and uh, the bread was commonly, you know, leavened in the ancient uh, world by using a little pinch of the old dough, putting it into the new uh, lump, and that is how the new lump would just rise up and, you know, would just look very nice and puffy and and good to um, eat. So this, in this way, the work of the leaven you know, was taught to illustrate the work of sin and pride, okay? So what he's saying here is remove out the old leave and means, you know, leave out your old sinful ways, okay? Don't even bring in a little sinful nature because you are now a new creation, which means you are now unleaving. That is why uh, God tells in the Passover, uh, at the Passover feast, that they had to remove all leaven from their house. No leaven was supposed to be in their house. Nothing but leaven had to be eaten for the whole week. Okay. So what Paul is basically saying is remove, you know, uh, everything in the in the church or everything in your midst as believers, as you know, uh, as saints. Everyone who is unrepentant sinners and everyone who's notorious, everyone who's living a life of sin, remove them away from the church. Okay, have nothing to do with them. Okay, so that you know, you who are created now as a new page, Christ Jesus, um, you know, by grace through faith in in Christ Jesus, you know, you would be without that leaven which will cause you to sin. So if you look at it in our context for our day today, is you now we are all made unleavened, which means we are all a new creation. Okay, and don't use any of your bring in your old sinful nature, which means don't feed your own sinful nature, okay, or don't uh, give in to your old sinful nature because that old sinful nature it can be one, it can be pride, it can be anger, it can be jealousy, it can be uh, hatred, um, you know, it can be uh, wrong thoughts, it can be what we are watching, you know, it can that can be our old sinful nature. But we can continue to indulge in one of those and that when it comes, you know, when as when we are born again, when that continues, we continue to live in that old sin nature, it's going to corrupt our, even our, uh, the, the new creation that we are now, okay? So, you know, the Bible says, don't give a foothold to Satan, you know, in your anger, do not sin. Okay, uh, do not give foothold to Satan. That means deal with your anger that day itself. Why? Because you just give a foothold to Satan, a little entrance, he will come in and he will destroy your entire life. Why? Because his his whole uh, role is, you know, to steal, kill, and to destroy. That is what he knows. That is what he will do. So don't give him room. So we need to be very uh, careful that even as we have been created now as people who are unleavened, you know, we cannot indulge in our little, little old sinful nature. We need to deal with that old sinful nature, you know, every day, look at it, otherwise it's going to 
corrupt our you know our, our new man our new creation that we are in Christ Jesus so the beautiful example is you know you can say how can my old sinful nature corrupt my new nature you know the example is here just a, a little lump of the old leaven can actually make the whole new leaven the whole new lump fluffy and you know, um, uh, puff up and the dove to rise. So the uh, old sinful nature, just one is enough to destroy us being a new creature, a new man that is created uh, in utter righteousness and holiness, you know, being justified before um, God. Okay. So Paul is writing this to the church, to the Jews, and they understand all of this. And that is why he's saying, but in our context, we need, we can look at it as, you know, old nature, new nature and don't feed your old carnal nature always you know keep feeding your spirit man okay? also we see that you know this was some passover which god told them to do this as an everlasting ordinance of generations to generation it was because it was a type and shadow of the redemptive work of christ in the new testament now what is the mean meaning of the word type and shadow you've heard this before right jesus christ is the type and shadow of the old testament or uh, you know uh, the type and shadow that we see in noah or moses is fulfilled in jesus christ so think of this word type and shadow okay now the new testament the greek word for type is typios uh, which means example uh, or it can be a pattern, a model, uh, you know, a pattern, model, form, print, uh, fashion, figure, manner. So here basically it's talking about that, you know, when it says that this ritual was a type and shadow of the redemptive work of Jesus or type and shadow of Jesus is basically meaning this ritual or this person, what he did, what God asked him to do is basically an example of what is going to follow okay it's a pattern of what is was done in the old testament is actually fulfilled in the life and ministry of jesus christ did you understand yes so all of the rituals are type and shadow of the work of jesus christ which means everything in the old testament was a the pattern in the old testament that was followed was fulfilled in the life and ministry of of jesus christ now what is the meaning of shadow we saw type type means pattern model uh, fashion uh, it's a print exactly so whatever was done in the old testament it was actually fulfilled in the work and the person of jesus christ what is the meaning of shadow now we know that shadow has no substance on its own right yes or no a shadow has no substance on its own it can only cast something that is uh, substantial okay so this table is substantial it is cast you can see the legs right of this table it's casting the shadow now this mic stand is um, substantial you can see the shadow right um, the speaker is substantial you can see the shadow of that uh, speaker so even when you go and stand out in the sun you can see your shadow because you are substantial but shadow is not something that is substantial it has no substance so the physical form so when we say um, shadow you know, Jesus Christ is the shadow of this ritual, the shadow of this person. It basically means a physical form of a spiritual reality. So when Jesus uh, or when God brought about these rituals or these sacrifices, it was something that was done in our physical world, but had something that ha had a heavenly reality okay uh, we read this in hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 and 10 verse 1 so all of the jewish ceremonies all of the jewish rituals everything that they did in the tabernacle in the temple um, all of those uh, uh, rituals all of those ceremonies were actually a shadow cast by heavenly realities which means it was pointing out to christ's life and the work and the kingdom reality okay what is in god's kingdom what is the reality in god's uh, kingdom so the old testament is basically the old testament passover is a type and shadow of jesus christ what do we mean by type and shadow of jesus christ basically type and shadow is that jesus christ is going to be that passover lamb okay the male lamb 
which, oh, and it had to be the perfect male lamb. And Jesus also was that male lamb who made, because he was perfect, he was sinless, he was righteous, utterly holy. Uh, he was that perfect um, Passover lamb. And the work of Jesus Christ also seen in the Passover lamb. Okay, the Passover lamb was, uh, you know, the lamb was uh, uh, killed, the blood was shed, and that blood was put on the doorposts, okay, of the house in which the sacrifice was made, and the angel of death passed over because of that blood. So when Jesus died on the cross, okay, his blood purchased our sins, our you know, and gave us freedom from death and from slavery. And so those who, uh, you know, believe in the shed blood of Jesus and the work what Jesus did on the cross, you know, now they are covered by the blood of the Lamb, which means that Satan has no power, authority over us because we have been purchased by the blood. Okay, and sin has no power over us because the blood of the Lamb has atoned for our sins, which means has covered our sins. So even as we are standing today, it's actually we are actually covered by the blood of the Lamb. If you just can picture it, we're covered by the blood of the Lamb. So when Satan looks at you, he's actually scared of you because you have the blood of the Lamb over you. Okay, but many times we are so scared of satan that he terrorizes us and he thinks he makes us think that he's more powerful but that is why it's so important to declare the blood of the lamb and what the blood of the lamb has done for us the blood of the lamb has uh, made the sacrifice for our sins delivered us from the power of sin so we are dead to sin the the blood of the lamb has given us uh, freedom from death okay the fear of death and eternal death the blood of the lamb also has given us freedom over um, uh, satan the power of satan because when jesus died on the cross remember we studied last week uh, colossians chapter 2 verse 15 um, um that you know jesus when he died on the cross you know he that the lamb that would uh, the blood was shed he became he uh, disarmed every principalities and powers and made a public spectacle of them and uh, we also saw in hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 or i think verse 5 that he's a captain of our salvation and because of what he did we celebrate uh you know we also have uh, received the victory what jesus has done on the um, cross okay so uh, the passover feast actually pointed out the true lamb jesus christ pointed out to how the true lamb would be uh, and would what the true lamb would accomplish okay so that is why uh, uh, you know the, the passover lamb was a type or the passover feast or the passover festival was a type and shadow of the person and the work of jesus um, christ okay so there's some important characteristic of the passover lamb the first thing uh, is we we read in exodus chapter 12 verse 5 the lamb had to be without blemish okay and jesus as the passover lamb was a lamb without sin was holy and was okay and that is why he could make the perfect complete uh sacrifice because he was perfect he was complete he was spotless he was whole and that is what first peter chapter 1 verse 19 says so can one of you please read that first peter chapter 1 verse 19 But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Yeah. spot. So Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, without blemish or without spot. Okay. Um, the second one is uh, second reference is one John chapter three verse five. Can somebody read that? You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. He manifested to take away our sin. What is the meaning of manifested? He became real. He showed himself. He became a reality. Uh, to take away the sin, uh, take away our sins, because in him there is no sin. So somebody asked you, show me from the Bible where it says Jesus had no sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. 
Okay, so he was a lamb without blemish, which means he was perfect, he was pure, and he was sinless. And that is why Jesus is called as the Passover lamb or the Paschal lamb. It's not just because he was spotless and blameless or without blemish, but also it points to the work what he was the, the Passover lamb did. It pointed out to what the lamb of God would do and accomplish for our sins. Okay. Any questions so far? Online students, any questions? Yeah, can you give him the mic, please? In Exodus, uh, we see God uh, giving them uh, instructions, right? How, uh, like, how they have to do the Passover, like cook the lamb and here, and uh, it mentions like, do not eat it raw, do not eat it boiled, but only roast it and. Uh, He's like fire with all uh, its legs and entails yeah. and everything. Yes. So it's like, is there a like why only roast and eat? Why not boil? Is there, is there any significance for it or? There should be some um, significance. Um, roasted in the fire and boil. There could be some significance, or I don't know why God just uh, told them, you know. Uh, but also, um, you know, when you talk about um, fire, it's, you know, the, you, when you see sacrifices that were made uh, in the Old Testament, when God made the, the, the first covenant, uh, you know, promise to Abraham. Uh, remember, he tells him to cut those, uh, that the bird and that ram and that uh, lamb and keep it there on the altar. And then he falls asleep and then God sends the fire that, that passes through. So every sacrifice that was made, even in the temple, was fire. The fire that basically burned up. So it's basically talking about that sin has, you know, is totally removed, is purified. There's cleansing through the fire. Could be one meaning or significance that is there. Because that is how they used to um, uh, do the sun and not boiling. You know, it was just to fire because um, like, uh, like we're going to look at um, the sacrifice, it is also, you know, of uh, uh, the sacrifice that God told them to make in the Old Testament was not just for the atonement of their sin, which means was to cover their sin, okay, but also was consecration, okay, consecrating themselves uh, to be holy and pure. So we know that you know anything that we need to make holy and pure is sent through the is passed through the fire, whether it's gold or you know any uh, any metal, anything you know is is put into fire because it is made pure, pure. It's purified. Okay, so that could uh, be one of the significance why he required them to you know use fire, and also fire was there in the. Uh, in the temple, which they use for burning sacrifices and the fire on the altar, you know, it was there. Yes, good question. Anyone else has any questions? Okay, another sacrifice that we can look at, uh, talking about the lamb and Jesus being the lamb of God and also he being the type and shadow. So we're going to look at um, uh, various ritual sacrifices in the Old Testament, which is talking about the lamb, a sinless lamb, and how Jesus was that type, and also how these um, uh, the rituals of and these sacrifices, how it was um, a shadow of what Jesus would do, his work, what he would uh, do. Another thing that we can see is the lamb of the morning and evening. Uh, sacrifice. So Exodus chapter 29 was 38 to 42. So can one of you please read that? Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lamps of the first year day by day continually. One lamp you shall offer in the morning and the other lamp you shall offer at twilight. But the one lamp shall be one tenth of an ispa of flour mixed uh, with one fourth of a hin of praised oil, 
and one fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering, and the other lamp you shall offer it to a light, and you shall offer with it the grain offering and the drink offering, as in the morning for a sweet aroma, an offering made by first fire to the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generation at the door of the uh, tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak with you. So every day, this morning and evening sacrifice had to be made. And why was the sacrifice required? It was, and it said that it's supposed to be made throughout the generations, but why did God require the sacrifice? Look at uh, Exodus chapter 29, it says what we just read. Why is it required? Okay, sweet aroma. Because he says, this is where I will meet with you and speak with you. Okay? So if God has to meet his people and speak to them every day, then, you know, it, they had to make sacrifice. Why did they have to make sacrifice morning and evening? If God had to speak to them, why did they have to make the sacrifice? Why did they have to make the sacrifice if God had to meet them? Sorry? Yes, to purify themselves so that this holy God can meet the sinless pe sinful people and he can meet them because their sin was atoned for. Okay? Now God, you know, he, he just can't relate to us because of our sin. He can't come near or relate to us because of our sins, so the sacrifices had to be made. So this daily sacrifice actually spoke of, um, you know, uh, yes, thank you, Nina, John, she said, because of sin, uh, so that God will meet us. Uh, this daily sacrifices spoke of daily atonement and daily consecration. Okay, what is atonement? What is the meaning of atonement? It's, I mentioned it three times in the last 43 minutes. Hello, class. What is atonement? What does atonement mean? Wakey, wakey. What is atonement? I, I mentioned it three times, three or four times, I explained it over and over again. What is atonement? It's okay, it doesn't matter. Try it in. Pay for it, that is redemption. Cover, yes, atone means to cover our uh, sin. Okay, so atonement is covering our sin. What is righteousness? What is the meaning of being righteous? Made righteous. Right standing with God? Okay, before we did not have a right standing with God because we are sin, sinful people. Now because of God, Christ's righteousness, God sees us as righteous people. What's the meaning of justification? How many of you attended church on Sunday? <laughs> I got you. <laughs> what is justification? Last two Sundays. Made right? God looks at us just as if we never sinned, okay? So atonement is when Jesus, you know, his blood covers our uh, sin, okay? So daily atonement and daily consecration. So these uh, morning and evening sacrifices were to be offered every day. They were burnt offerings and sacrifices, um, which is completely burnt at the altar, okay? So the fire... Uh, just burnt up everything, purified that sacrifice, made it holy and pleasing to God so God can relate with uh, man, okay? And we saw, um, uh, you know, um, two weeks back we were talking, last week and week before last we were talking about the uh, Day of Atonement, 
okay the high priest going into the holy of holies uh, how what atoned for his sins what atoned for the sins of the high priest who went into the holy of holies on the day of atonement the high priest went into the holy of holies okay what atoned for his sin the blood of the lamb the blood that he sacrificed for himself the blood was the sacrifice for the sins of the whole israelite community he would take it and sprinkle it where on the mercy seat of the ark of the covenant that is where the presence of god would come and god would relate to man god would speak to man why don't we have the tabernacle why don't we have the mercy seat why don't we um off, offer these um, sacrifices and sprinkle all of that why don't we do it in our churches today Jesus Christ already made the full sufficient perfect sacrifice when he died the 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 veil of the curtain that separated the holy place and the holy of holies was you know torn into two which means it gave us the access aren't you all happy that you are not living in the old testament days that you're living in the new testament time you know the new covenant but the blood of jesus has done so much as we imagine the number of sacrifices we had to make the amount of money we had to do so much living in fear when we would be struck by the wrath of god but just the grace and the mercy of god that is upon us uh, nina says standing as if one has not sinned um you're talking uh, uh, that is for justification or righteousness i think that's for justification right okay um so here we see that this morning and evening sacrifices had to be offered daily they were burnt offerings completely burnt on the uh, altar uh, in addition to the lamb sacrifice god tells them you also have to present in the morning an ifa of mixed flour with a hin of pressed oil of one fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering and then in the in the evening sacrifice twilight means sunset okay evening when it's he it talks about not just making the lamb as a sacrifice but also offering a grain offering and a drink uh, offering okay so here we see that um uh, this grain offering or drink offering was also uh, known as a meal offering uh, which consisted of products and did not contain blood okay so the burnt offering was primarily uh, you know which made the atonement or the covering for the sins of the the people the lamb that was sacrificed was the substitute in the place of the the per okay the that was in the place of the israelite community as a nation as a whole the lamb the animal the lamb was a substitute okay and that took the place of an israelite or it took the place of the entire israelite community in the same way jesus made for the atonement for our sins which means just like the lamb was in was a substitute the animal was as a substitute in the same way jesus was our substitute we had to die but he was in our place he took our place and he made uh, you know this possible um for us and this burnt offering spoke of complete consecration because the entire sacrifice was consumed with fire okay when it is consumed with fire means it's a pleasing uh, holy acceptable uh, offering and a sacrifice to god okay and god was pleased with that um, sacrifice remember cain and abel sacrifice right when cain offered uh, his um, sacrifice of uh, fruit and grain whatever he brought from the field and when um, when abel made his sacrifice god sent blood on i'm sorry fire that burnt up abel's sacrifice so fire again resembles that god is pleased with that sacrifice remember elijah um, on the on the mount carmel when he makes that sacrifice you know god sends fire from above and burns up not only the animal not only the 
uh, the firewood, but even stones. Stones never burn in fire, right? But everything was utterly burned. So it just means that, you know, spoke of complete consecration as the entire sacrifice was consumed in fire. Okay, so we'll stop here. We'll go for our break and then we'll come back after the break and uh, continue. So enjoy your break, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. 